Hello, everybody. Hey, Vadim. By the way, how do I pronounce your name? Is it Vadim or Vadim? Or something else? Like, is the I, do you pronounce the I? Last one. So, Vadim. Like, Yosef Valim. Vadim. Okay. Yeah, we're three people already. Look at that. I'm just gonna share the stream. Okay. I got a new lens. You can see how nicely blurry it is. That is a lens, that is not a filter. And you can see it when it like focuses on my eyes, that it makes a little jump there. You see that? That is a new lens. I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah. Looks good. I think it looks good. Okay. Well, we can just get started, maybe. Ah, hey, Zigu. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, let's just get started, and then the rest will, the rest will come or not. Um, wait. Let me. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to another live stream of Peter Reviews Code. Uh, today we have two GitHub repositories that were sent to me through Twitter. Uh, thank you very much for submitting them. And um, yeah, one of them is a library for testing. So that's going to be interesting. It's going to be about macros. Um, and in general, uh, there is a, yeah, it, it, like it's a library that extends X unit, basically. So that's going to be interesting. And the other one is going to be a live view app uh, for ether i think to connect with ethereum if i'm not mistaken but yeah we will, we will see in a moment uh, what that means so let me switch over to uh, where's my where's my browser that's here there is my browser all right so these are the two repositories that we're going to review today ah, come on oh yes yeah, there we go. One of them is Mnimi. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It is a snapshot testing for Elixir X unit. And it is about snap so snapshot test asserts that some expression matches a reference value. It's like a regular assert, except that the reference value is generated for you. Okay. Uh, follows in the footstep of existing snapshot testing libraries like Instar, expect test and assert value. Uh, here's an uh, here's a little all right here's a little uh, example um, drop events should remove all events from an enum and then you have auto assert drop events okay they don't assert anything what oh so that, oh, that's pretty cool. Wow. Okay, so apparently this library, as I understand it, it's smart enough to realize what we're asserting. Um, Neem will generate the patterns and prompt you with diffs. So in this case, okay, probably it looks at the output of like what is the output of this function. And then it realizes, okay, the output of the function is all odd numbers, for example. And... Um, Maybe that's a way. And the next time you just have that value and if, if then like you assert the output of that, um, your function basically against a, a fixed a list or a fixed assertion, like a fixed thing that you want to check. So if things do change, you're prompted again and you can choose to accept on update the test or reject the change and let it fail. All right, so that... Okay, that's why why it's called snapshot, um, because you run your test once, then you save that result, 
when the tests are correct, you save the result in your test. And then later on, when you change your system, you always check your functions against the snapshot result uh, that you have like uh, saved, so to say. That's pretty cool, pretty smart. So we assume, okay, it always should re return this. And if it doesn't, then it's broken. Cool. Um, yeah, let's go to the code. This is a meme, Nimi, Nimi. Nimi, okay, Nimi. Um, yeah, so this is very much for testing. So probably, oh boy, okay, that is interesting. So we got our Nimi uh, main function, and that just in, um, uh, that's actually a smart thing if you've never done that. Uh, if you have a README, and in the README you have a lot of information about your library, and you don't want to copy paste all that information into your uh, module here so that Hex picks it up. Like Hex, the, the package manager, they look at your module uh, module docs, basically. So sometimes you want to have your readme as your module doc as well so that it shows on the, the main page of your um, of Hex. And you can use that, actually. Um, like you can use mdoc, like you read the readme, uh, you split it, and then you just put it on, the, um, on this attribute, and then you put it into your... Uh, your documentation here. And that means at this position, um, the NIMI module will have our readme, yeah, this one here. Everything that is below this, that's going to be inserted into our module, and then Hex picks it up and shows it on the website. And also, um, this one, like if you have the, I don't know, Elixir LS never works for me. Uh, but if you have Elixir LS working, then you will see in the module description everything in the README. So that's a nice little hack to have the documentation in the README and then to put it into your uh, module doc as well. Yeah, little trick here. I already learned something. Look at that. By the way, is the, the creator of the library, C or that person here? Let's drop a note. would be nice to know who it is. All right, so I think around Nimi, so I think there were two. There will be two interesting things to look at. One of them is the auto assert macro here. So um, you know that's going to be the first function that I want to look at. Like how is that defined? How is it written? And then the second thing is going to be how these prompts are created. You know, if we don't have the snapshot, like this library looks at the output of the test and then suggests the the prompt. So that's going to be the second thing to look at. So I would say let's first look at the order cert. And that is somewhere uh, probably def or def macro. Yeah. So this is it. It's defined in the NIMI. Okay. So uh, the order cert macro has a build assertion with order assert. Uh, oh, that's also cool. So you have different macros and then you have a f helper function like build assertion that does exactly like it's um, that actually builds the assertion. So this is very flexible. You know, if you would implement the same thing over and over again, you would need to add it or remove it if you wanted to add another assertion. So the build assertion function seems to be the main function here that builds all the things. And it is over here. OK, and it receives a call like outer assert received, then the arguments and the caller. And the caller, what is that? Is that, i never seen that. Is it an Elixir thing, caller? Is it like module? Elixir, special forms. Returns the current, sorry, a little bit bigger. Returns the current calling environment as macro env struct. Interesting. Uh, in the environment, you can access the file name, line number, alias, function, and others. Macro env. Okay, that's a context that contains the context, file, function, which function called it, which line of that file, which the current module name. Interesting. Okay, ah, right, because you use the assertion in your test modules. Okay, so I mean, for example, if you use order assert, 
if you use auto assert, like here, for example, uh, like auto raise something, then you want to have this module. You want to know, all right, where was this function called? And that's going to be, the information of that's going to be here in the caller. That is interesting. I learned something. Wow. Not wow that I learned something. It's just wow what I've learned. So, anyway. So when we have the build assertion here, we first ensure that is in a test and we basically check the function name and we, okay, check that the function name is starting with test and that should work because we always have the test macro here. Nice little workaround to be honest. Yeah. And otherwise the call can only be used inside of a test. All right. So and if it is in a test, then we call the assertion build and uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try to fix my Elixir LS here, but I'm also, it's it's hopeless at this point. I've given up on Elixir LS. Yeah, whatever. Resetting server failed. Add one of them. Ah, because I don't have the right uh, Elixir uh, version here installed. Ah, that's fine. Okay, then it's not Elixir LS fault. Sorry about that. But I'm not sure, like, have you had issues with Elixir LS? It's not about Elixir LS, it's more like Visual Studio Code, I think, and the connection with Elixir LS. And it's just, I can't use it anymore. Like, my formatting doesn't work. I have to manually format all the time. Uh, I, you know, like, the whole going to definition thing doesn't work. Yeah. The, the only thing I use it for is basically the syntax coloring. <laughs> like, yeah. What happens if it is called inside another macro, like with mock from mock lib? That's a good question, and I have not, I don't have the answer. But um, yeah, not only Visual Studio Code. Uh, I don't know. A friend of mine, my colleague, he uses NeoVim, and he says NeoVim it works like a charm. So maybe I should switch to NeoVim. But then people wouldn't understand anymore how I do things here, like just clicking, you know. And also, I wouldn't know where I am. Yeah, uh, I don't know, Vadim. Um, that would be an interesting question to ask the, the author. Yeah, I hear there's going to be greater focus on Elixir LS experience. Fingers crossed. Yes, very much fingers crossed. It works great on Nervium for some reason. Yeah, I, I, I keep on hearing that. But I mean, if I can configure Neowim to look like Visual Studio Code, I don't have to click, but like, you know, just having the bar here on the left and then the different files up there, I might consider switching, but just might. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, but um, Vadim, sorry, I can't answer your question. I don't know, but I, I would need to write my own little macro now, but I, I don't want to do that now in, you know, because we don't have the time. So I would say uh, let's move further to the assertion build. So it would be here, assertion, that is an assertion. Oh, there's a version of Neovim that looks exactly like that. Yeah. Maybe I'll check that out. Maybe next time we do this in Neovim and I will just spend half an hour trying to get the, the files that I want. You know, instead of just clicking here, you need to, whatever. We'll figure that out next time. All right, so I got the assertion here and I'm looking for the build. This is the build function because that's what we call here in our build assertion uh, whenever we create this assertion. Right, so we call the build with a call, so order assert, for example, the arguments and the caller. Okay, so now in the build function, we ooh, build our own AST. Look at that, this is some fancy shit right here. Um, okay, we get the lo location of the caller. What is the location? I got the function here. Function, uh, sorry, location, right? Ah, here, location. The keyword list containing the file and line information as keys. Okay. And so it gets file and line. The kind, well, we call this call before. You know, that might be something you can improve because it's a called kind here, but it's called call here. You know, you might also want to rename this to kind or something. Yeah, kind, a kind of assertion, like what kind of assertion are we having here? Might be better than just call, yeah. Okay, now we get the arguments. So we create our own little tuple here. The call, how the function's name, the location where it is called, and then some arguments. And now what we do is we do a quote, uh, and we create a new assertion. 
And assertion context, binding, binding, assertion run, boy. Ah, then we assert it, okay. So this is, okay, so this is run only when we call the assertion. Because I like for me, it's a little, you know, I, I'm, I don't really understand what happens here if I use like this macro, you know, I like I have a function here that is assert race, for example. Like just by writing this, I don't execute it, right? But probably what happens, that would be my assumption, is that we make this new and we call the run function um, do run stage new update patch uh, patch assertion. Wow, we got like a whole server going on here. This is some fancy shit. Patch assertion. Okay, we got a gen. Wow, I have to take a step back. This is this is a lot. Okay, so my question basically here is like why I went down this rabbit hole is um, why do we run the assertion? Because my under my my thinking here would be you know we write the function and by writing the function like like by using the macro we just compile our assertion macro behind it. You know we build the assertion as we call it here and then we can insert it into this place in the code you know when we compile the code but it's also running it at the same time right the build function it uh, creates it and then it runs it immediately i have no clue why that is but let's look at the new one maybe like the, the new function maybe then we understand better what's happening so it's up here and we get the the kind, um, the okay. Now we ignore eval expression ast. Okay, so we ignore the location, and we have the arguments, and then we have a value, and the value comes from the expression that we kind argument. Wow, what is happening here? What does value eval expression do? Do we have a def? No, here. Value eval expression, message received. So we wanna have the order assert run. That is the basic one, value expression, order assert. And then, you know, I woke up this morning at 5 a.m. because I still had to finish my talk for ElixirConf Africa. So I am freaking tired. <laughs> and this is a freaking complicated library. So my head hurts. But thank you for providing this. I, I really like this. I never, this is some next level shit. This is really, really impressive. Um, yeah, thank you, Zigu, for uh, for organizing the conference and, and speaking too, I heard. Sorry, I had to leave after my talk. I uh, had other things, but it was fun. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, so I have no clue what's happening here. Um, but I guess this is kind of a, we extract the expression from our call. But I would I would need to dive deeper into this. Sorry, I... I don't have the headspace to do that right now, but let's let's move back maybe. Let's because I wanted to understand the new one, the new function better. Maybe we understand where's the new function here. So maybe we understand better what's happening. Okay, so we build an assertion structure. That is something I understand. Uh, we evaluate the uh, well, we evaluate the expression here, and that gets passed as the value. Okay, so probably we run whatever we put on the right side here. So um, order set, like on this side, we would run whatever this expression is. And then we would receive the output four. So that would be the value that goes in here. Okay. Now, and then we create an assertion of the kind, the stage, what is the get stage? Where is it used? Down here. Okay, so the stage, is pattern update pattern new i guess oh god what goes in here wait 
get stage the kind and the arguments. Okay. Get stage the kind and the arguments. And when. Boy, oh boy. Ah, so we have a when. Okay. So we can either use this uh, left error or we can use, well, we also have to use a left error here, but we can also use a when. So we have, uh, okay, so this f library offers us even a more fine granular way of testing our left side, like, um, which is a good example. Like a good example would be, yeah, right here, like just integers, okay. Um, so we could do outer assert, and then we want to have like mm, result, when result, when is integer. Well, just something like this. And then on the right side, we do something, uh, for example, uh, string to integer. No, I'm not entirely sure whether it works. No, whatever. But what I want to do is basically like on the right side, we might have a function that either returns as an integer, you know, something like four, or it might return maybe a string, like a binary. And if it returns the binary, then on the left side, well, we can say it should be four, right? Um, but we can even do another test on top of this where we say, well, I don't want to, you know, accept any four. I want to see that it's, ah, this doesn't make sense but maybe you get you get you understand what i mean like we can have another when here um maybe yeah because sometimes you might have a variable that you get returned and then uh it's interesting like uh for example we can do have like int um or result when integer result and then we do like string pass I think something like this, you know. I think that's how integer pass works. My XLS doesn't work right now. But so in this case, for example, um, we would have a function on the right side and it does something and it returns a value. And on the right on the left side, then we want to check that first of all, you know, the function was successful. So you have an okay. And then we also want to check that the result is an integer. So whatever. Like my point is more like you can uh, have a guard in your assertion on the left side. And that is why here in get the stage, we have the when here. So we check whether there is uh, also a when guard. And in that case, we like get the pattern from this situation. And if there's no when, then we get the pattern from the first level here. So this is basically decoding um, what we write, I guess here, yeah. All right, this is all very, very, very complex stuff. Man, this is... But what we do, basically, is we create an assertion, struct, boom. That's what we do. And uh, then we run it, and I have no clue why. <laughs> well, folks, I'm not sure about you, but for, Ms. for me, this is all very impressive. Um, it is an amazing library. Man, I, I really, this teaches you so much about macro programming. And uh, probably if you read the book, Macro Programming with Elixir, and then you read this library, you will understand it better. In my case, I'm just very blown away. I like it all very much. I mean, it's a super technical. It is super complex. Um, yeah, I don't really have any suggestions. You know, there was just a little thing with like, you call it call here, and then it's a kind on the other side. But this is just a little consistency, consistency thing. Um, yeah, I guess, but I mean, to be fair, I also haven't read the readme in, in total, like uh, quick start, pattern matching, generated patterns. Yeah, you have great documentation too. Formatting, editor support, sorcerer, yeah. Maybe yeah, a, a suggestion, ah, not even really. Like I was, you know, I was, I was supposed, uh, I was suggesting, suggesting that you would write a little flow diagram, basically, or something where you explain how the thing works under the hood. Um, you know, like you have the macro and you build an assertion, and in the build here, 
yeah, but you don't even need to do that. It's so technical. If it works, it works. Yeah, just be aware that I think other people will have a hard time to dive into this. Um, I mean, I'm totally, I have no clue about macros. I avoid them whenever I can, but for this library, it makes perfect sense. So, you know, yeah. Anyway, um, there is a gen server though. Maybe I can I can understand the gen server better. It's a server. Oh man, look at these logs. Okay, there's no module doc, but there's a big doc here. So maybe put this in a module doc, just as a suggestion. <laughs> um, patches are primarily the patches are primarily responsible for managing I/O, uh, because they're asynchronous. We have to carefully control the outputs so that the results are not written to the terminal while we're prompting the user for input. Wow, this is great documentation. I am blown away. Who wrote this again? Sech, Sak, Sak, Elon, Sak, Sak, Elon, I guess. However you pronounce your name. Ah, actually, you have a video demo too. Ah, oh, look at that. This is a ten out, of, a twelve out of ten star. Look at. Let's look at this together. I am blown away. I'm not sure how he did this, but this is cool already. Okay, clear. Wow, you even got this fancy layout and everything. Do you accept that? And you, you step through every single test? That is amazing. I think this is the best UI I've ever seen when it, com when it, comes, when it comes to these libraries. Okay. The value has changed. All right. Yeah, it is interactive and fun. Give it a try. My only question here is like, how do I actually put it into my um, tests, in my test suite? Like if I run my mixed test, does it fail or does it open this interactive mode? Because I don't want that. I want it to fail, you know? That's my only point. All right, folks. Uh, this has been an amazing journey into something that is way out of my league, but it has been really, really impressive. So I will come back to this when I have more headspace and I'm not tired, and I will try to understand this better. This has been really cool. All right, moving on. Moving on to the next one. So, yes. Uh, the second library for today is called Either Chat. The Ether Chat is a web interface to ChatGPT API implemented in Phoenix Live View. Oh, it's a capstone project for Dockyard Academy. So this person, low text, Steve Freeman. He's called Steve Freeman from Austin. Hey, Steve. Are you there, Steve? Please drop a line in the chat. Would be nice to, to have your input on this. Um, all right, so this is a connection to ChatGPT API, and then probably with a live view where I can input my prompt. It requires the API key, organization key. It uses GPT 3.5 Turbo, changed to GPT 4 by uncommenting the in the Open API X. All right, that's good. Uh, usage, how to set it up? Okay. Uh, let's let, maybe let's try it. Um, was it either either chat there? Yeah. Right, yeah, sure. I trust this also. Steve looks Steve Freeman looks like a very trustworthy person. Okay. So let me let me get the either chat. And let's start out probably. Is a database? No, it doesn't look like it. Alright. And this is it. Wait, I'm gonna move my head down. Whoop. Yep. So welcome. Uh, share this room. You can, we can even share this room. All right. So if I do, ah, come on, arc. Give me split, split right. Yes. What's happening? Split right. We want to go. Oh, I have the same URL. Uh, or create a new random chat room. Well, then I will do the following. Oops. I will create two browsers side by side. Okay. And I'm going to move. No, sorry. 
Come on, head. Move. Thank you. All right, so we got ChatGPT on the left and on the right. I'm not entirely sure what should happen. I haven't set up the API key, maybe, but let's see what happens. So test prompt and I submit and it is loading. And is it doing something? No, it doesn't do anything. Bad return value. You didn't provide an API key. You need to provide your API key. All right, I have an API key, but I'm not sure where. All right, well, first off, Steve, uh, user feedback. <laughs> if an error occurs, then, uh, and it's also retrying, it looks like it. Uh, so let's reload this one. But did you see this? This is really cool. If I make a test prompt on the left side, it actually changes the right side, you know, because the, the loading spinner here and everything. There you go. You got collaboration right out of the bat. This is really nice. And uh, just to check, like if I create a new chat room and like if they're not connected, right? Yeah. So on the left side, it only does it on the right side. It doesn't. Uh, sorry, I should have set up the open uh, API key. Maybe I have an API key somewhere. Yeah, anyway. So let's move to the code. The, I really like this. This is a nice project. Thank you, Steve, for submitting this. We don't have an, uh, a repo. So let's look at our... Uh, uh, actually, okay, let's look at our chat app here. So this seems to be quite uh, simple. We only have the application in which we have the PubSub endpoint, open API, which is a gen server. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's have a look here. So this is our main gen server that handles implements gen server interface and it saves the message state. Oh, there's an X open API library. I didn't know that. Boom. X open API Elixir, maybe. Here. Auto-generated unofficial SDK for interacting with open API APIs. Open AI APIs. Cool, I didn't know that. Using ChatGPT APIs. Oh, cool. So you can use ChatGPT, uh, the completion, and you can specify the, uh, the model and even some other stuff. That is pretty cool. I did not know this exists. All right. I learned something. So let's have a look at the OpenAI um, thing. So our, if we init it, we ignore the ops that we hand it in and we give it, give it an empty state or an empty argue, empty state, yeah. Um, yeah, you can do that. Mm, just be aware that, you know, if you want to change something here, then you need to uh, also uncomment this there. Yeah, okay. At the bottom, please. Yeah, so uh, good one. Um, okay, and the send is at the bottom. So just a little code, code like for gen servers, you know, just a little code uh, formatting suggestion. At the you have the callbacks, and you have the API, the interface basically. So you have the the public API, and that would be, for example, the init, and that would be send. So I'm going to move these two up here. And then below that, you have all the callbacks and the private functions. Yeah. This way, I can look at your gen server, and I, I know exactly, immediately, which functions I can call on it. And I see, OK, send is the main function here. And then you can move the, the private functions. Yeah, I, I move them. Uh, the low IR start link obviously is also public, so I'm going to move it here, but this is like very standard. So then I see, all right, so we have uh, a handle call for the when, yeah, so when we call the send function, we call the gen server. Uh, that's the name, right? Okay, that's hard coded. What I usually do is I don't use this, I use a module like this, and then it has the name of this module. That makes it easier because then in other in other functions outside of this gen server, you can also make gen server call 
and you can call this function if you want. For whatever reason, you want to send it some messages, then you do chat open API, open AI, sorry. You know, and then you can send your message here. So just a, a suggestion to use a module instead of your self. No, self is the pit. If you, uh, if you do this, then it's the pit. And then if you want to call this from outside, because like if you, what would you do with the name here? It's kind of like a singleton. You know, you only want to have one gen server of this name running. And that's why you use the, the module thing here, you know, and now you can't sp start a second gen server this type. But if you use self, I could spin up multiple instances because the pit is every time it's a new one. Yeah, and then you even you don't need the pit, you don't need self. Gen server calls self. Oh, sorry. Uh, you mean gen server call to self? Yeah, it it's the same. You can also do this, and then you're calling yourself. But you know, it it's easier if you use the same. But yeah, you can do both. Yeah. All right. So we got a call here, and the timeout is set to fifty seconds. Yeah which is quite high. We're waiting for the response for 50 seconds. If I'm not mistaken, it makes a synchronous call. Yeah, it makes a synchronous call and waits for its reply. 50 seconds, I'm not sure, that's a very high. Like if you don't get an, a reply from AI, open AI in 50 seconds, you might wanna cancel. By default, it's set to five seconds, I think. Might be better, you know? Otherwise, like what I did, for example, oh, actually that might happen. So, um, you know, I had the um, a thing running here. Oh, I'm not running it anymore. <laughs> the chat slow mode. Yeah, I mean, I have I have the chat on the o OBS here, and I also have it on my phone. So maybe I see it on the phone faster. I'm gonna have a look at the phone too. Yeah. Slow mode. Ah, like this. But anyway, uh, what I wanted to say is like when I make a prompt here, you know, it might take up to 50 seconds until I get a re response. You know, and if you set this to five seconds, it's, it might be better. But let's not, um, let's not like, you know, let's move on. So in this case here, uh, you, yeah, you say if I uncomment this out, then it will use ChatGPT4. You could make that, um, oh, Wait, hang on. Uh, what I wanted to say here is like, you have the comment here and that's the only way to change the, the modules. Yeah, in this case, you really need to go into the code and change it, the code and then restart your server. And um, then you are actually not restart your server, but make another request, Re refresh the page at least. So what you could also do is make this a uh, an option, maybe for example, for send. You know, you'd, you would hear, uh, you would have sent the message and then you would have the model and that can default to GPT-3. Uh, actually, you can't do that. Three, five, I think, turbo, yeah, like this. And then you can put that in your message, model, and then you got the model here. And well, you can do a case if you want to model and then case, sorry, module. And then you do this, boom, like this, or you can also use a private function. So in, in the, my point is basically, in this case, you immediately make it easier to change the model from outside. Like I can, I can write my live view now in a way where in the live view, I can select my model and you know, whenever I send a message in my live view, I send the appropriate model that I want to use. So immediately you can expose the model to the user and you don't need to have that, that comment here. And what, yeah, actually what I like to do is have um, private functions that match. So you would do, what was that? You would have a function like this and that returns the string name like that. Boom, then you can get rid of, rid of all of that. Uh, you know, model string name, whatever, model name for model and this is yeah well something like that sorry i'm not very good with naming today 
But then, you know, you can easily extend that if you have more models, you want to support more modules, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, well, this is not, uh, you know, regards of naming, like your GPT, like you named the GPT, but it's actually the model that you're using, the GPT model. So model might be a better name in that case. Now you have a, a connection, um, sorry, now let me answer the, the messages. Um, you're 30 seconds before you can send the next message. Is it something that I can that I can change? I maybe. Whoa. Ah, slow mode. Non-mod chat delay. Six seconds. Two seconds. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was I was wondering like why do, why does it take so long for somebody to answer? Yay. Wow. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Now, uh, I want to, like, class 69 ask, I wonder if it's just uh, because ChatGPT responses take a long time to generate, although I would think we'd want to stream the response if so. If I'm not mistaken, I saw something in the OpenAI uh, library where they said streaming is still experimental, so maybe that's why it's 50 seconds. Um, yeah. Do you have a recommendation for a Phoenix Framework course? <laughs> Uh, well, I have a I have a course called Build an MVP with Elixir. You can go to Peter Ulrich here. There is actually below the links below, uh, where I explain to you how to set up an application with Phoenix. So if you're interested in that, um, you know, to set up the application, to deploy it to the cloud, and then you know even receive money through Lemon Squeezy. So like we implement a payment processor. However, if you are interested in like the Phoenix framework to understand that better. I don't think there's, well, actually, there's a course. I think there's a course by, uh, no, not about Phoenix, but about Phoenix Live View. And there's uh, from the Pragmatic Studio, there's a course about Live View. And if you learn Live View, you also learn a lot about the Phoenix framework. And then there's a book, uh, Phoenix 1.4, I think it's called. And that is very much focused on Phoenix. So that might be interesting for you. Um, yeah. Okay. Now you can all throw messages at me <laughs> thank the lord all uh, right yeah is there anything else i can because i have this chat thing on the chat uh shield mode let's look together we have the shield mode non-mod chat delay two seconds i'm just gonna unselect this clear chat from view for your non-mods now you can then scroll down again right so i just turned this off no i'm gonna leave this on channel modes Chat verification. All chatters must have verified email. I like that though. Phone verification now. Automat. I'm gonna dial this down. A little moderation. All right. Okay. Now I hope it's better. Slow mode. All these new things. I should just move to YouTube again. Maybe YouTube might make it easier. Anyways, let's move on. Let's go back to the code. So. Yeah, regarding streaming OpenAI responses. Oh, wow. By Sean Moriarty. Yeah. Space oh, okay. Stream next. Okay. So if you want to stream it, you need to use HTTP poison, then the stream. I open you need to open the stream and then to pass the, the chunks one by one. Jesus happening. What's happening here? Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, amazing article. I have not seen that before. Another one for streaming. Wow. Streaming API is responses. We're building application interface with OpenAI ChatGPT and want to create real-time interactive experience. That's exactly what this uh, application did. Um, to do this, we will need to work with the ChatGPT streaming API, which is built using the HTTP server send events. Okay with rec in this time yeah stream and then you have a response there finch stream and you make a post oh and you just add it to the body i guess until it's done status header okay yeah well thank you so much for all these amazing suggestions if you want to learn more about the streaming uh in general but it's particularly for open ai Two very great articles. Thank you very much for that information. Now, where were we? We were doing some code review, if I'm not mistaken. 
So uh, let's go back to it. Uh, what I wanted to say about this thing here, you mix with and case statements. So, and the case statement here is actually not necessary because, you know, you just return what you have as an error. So you can remove this and you can simply do, okay, res, whoops. Hey, my Elixir LS works again. Boom. And maybe this one. And it doesn't, it's crashed. Ah. Ah, one day. Yeah, now it works again. All right. Um, yeah, just suggestion. You don't need the case statement. You can just do a with. And I mean, you have a with here for making a call that can almost never fail. So you don't need that. You can also put it bef uh, behind, uh, before, sorry, uh, messages. Yeah, and then you don't need this. And then you can just do this. And that's it. List first response choices. And if you want to have the first one out of the list, you can just pattern match. Um, you can do that is like choices and then you have first well you know let's let's do it like this but you don't need the the list first you can just do on this side choices and then choice and then the rest boom boom and rest there you go a little pattern matching for you now you reply with the message content um first yeah now it works what's this ah sorry that missed too like this and uh yeah that's about it really um new message right yeah these refactors feel good <laughs> that's true yeah but it's just you need to get used to with statements and pattern matching and everything so all right uh so let's we already have 48 minutes, 10 minutes left. I want to finish on time today. So let's have a look at the live views because it's always interesting. Chat live. So this is our main chat. Uh, there. All right. So first of all, if we are connected, we subscribe to the endpoint. Oh, actually, we have a function on the endpoint for subscribing. That is smart uh, to the chat. Where do we implement this? Interesting. Oh, they have a new, I think they have a new API for uh, subscribing. No, no, it's just subscribe. All right, so yeah, we are sub subscribing to the chat and the chat in this case is a user provided parameter. Might not be the best idea to use that. Um, you know, I can enter a very long string here and then you know, do that many, many times. Well, actually, well, my, my idea here is like, you know, um, if you, like if you have the, the user provided input, there's always security issues. Like, you know, you need to, you, you don't know actually what might happen. So safer it is, safer is to, for example, have like a chat ID, you know, or a slug in your, in your string. It, it can be it can be what you had like um with the like if i go to localhost 18 ah uh, sorry chat yeah so like it could be the analyze moral brigade that might be you know that could be the id uh like you are, we also call that a slug and then with that slug you could get the the chat from like the context you know get chat by slack so to say so and then you can only subscribe to the chat id that is a little safer than using a user provided thing just in case okay but moving back now we subscribe only when we're connected that is smart and now we have a big uh, assignment here you know little i don't know i i actually i'm not sure why but my usually we break the lines because it's so long it's hard to read so a nicer, I, I think a nicer way of assigning stuff like that is to um, use functions like a pipeline, you know, pipes. And then you can either 
assign multiple at once, or you do the following, where you do assign uh, and so on. Like, yeah, in this case, you can also group. Wait, I missed something. Oh, sorry, these are temporary signs. Yeah, that's why this needs to go here. Yeah, this is already a little, a little better. Yeah, just to, to break that out, like just to break the assignment out of from what you return here. Um, you know, don't put everything in the in the tuple, in the response tuple. Oh yeah, uh, that's a good point. Now we have streams as well in live view. So temporary signs. Yeah. But to be honest, I don't know. I'm, I, I haven't made up my mind about streams yet. They seem to be like a, a silver bullet for many people. I still like temporary signs because, um, yeah, but they're, they, you know, you don't understand them as well. But I don't know, like streams feels for me like something I'm actually updating. But if I never update something, if I just assign it once and then I don't want to update it again, like I can also work with temporary signs, right? Yeah, but probably streams is the future. Uh, actually, I don't know what the um, uh, what the, the logic is, how, you know, the t syntax. But um, yeah, let, let's look it up. Phoenix, live view, streams. Let's all learn together. Streams. Yeah, stream. Um, wait. Stream socket. Ah, so instead of a sign, right? We do. So we need to do the prompt and the response. So we can do probably this, yeah, socket and then prompt and response. And then we can get rid of this. I think that should work, yeah. Stream. Uh, I think this is not using the latest live view, 18, 16. Yeah. No, they had it back then. Required them. Um, no streams. But it does it. 1816. 1816. 18 plus. Hmm. I think it, it's something in the helpers. The web helpers. Probably here, the view helpers, like maybe it was not with Phoenix 1.7. What's the latest? Four or something? I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. So th that is my thinking too. So um, with streams, like I'm also thinking, you know, I'd rather use them if I really like delete something from my list or I add something to my list. Everything that you had to do with temporary signs where you had to do the update and then in the update you added the item to the front of the list and then in the template you had to say how like where it should be put in or whatever like long story but yeah for me it's also a little bit like you know sometimes i just want to have like render the list once and then i want to forget about it so then i wouldn't use a stream you know because i don't want to add something to it but maybe that's a way like you know where they will optimize for memory consumption everything yeah so probably using streams for lists is safer in the future too but yeah, I, I, I share your, um, you know, your criticism or like your cautiousness about this. Anyway, um, let's move on because I, I want to finish in a couple of minutes and we haven't really looked through all the thing yet. Um, so first of all, we have a handle event of the prompt. So we are entering a prompt. We are broadcasting that prompt. Yeah. Maybe again, user input, you want to do a little bit of user sanitization here. Otherwise, somebody enters the whole, I don't know, the Bible five times, and then you send a huge chunk of text um, to everybody who's subscribed. You know, you know, you can limit this one to whatever five hundred characters, for example. Now we start a child. When after this, uh, in the supervisor, we send. 
Oh, okay. Okay, so whenever we have a prompt, we start a, a child task. Or, um, yeah, actually a task. And that one actually makes the request to the OpenAI. That's pretty smart. Yeah, this way we can work and continue to work with our live view. Um, but yeah, but uh, man, so many things today. We can, we can continue with our live view to handle messages while our task is running in the background. And it's a child, so if our live view um, um, uh, crashes, also the child crashes, so we don't need to worry about cleaning up. And I like this one because then eventually we broadcast, once it's done, to this chat, the new response. Response. All right. I like this a lot, yeah. I'm just thinking, not using a task. I like it, yeah. Yeah, you learned about broadcast subscribed. Welcome. This is uh, one of the most useful things ever. <laughs> yeah. All right. So then once we receive the message back in here, we use the pay the message payload and assign it to the response. That's interesting because um, let me just let me just redo this one to the original because here you had the response. You had an empty list. But if you get a new message, you it's a string, you know, just to say there's a little inconsistency here. You know, it's better to then say this is nil um, instead or yeah, not empty string, just nil. And then, you know, OK, it's not a list. It's, you know, nil. Same with prompt, because I think you store the prompt here. Uh, oh, yeah broadcast new prompt and then you handle it here and you do the same there here yeah. all right loading true loading false nice i like it so far yeah just you know uh for codes uh for code um suggestion you know have the official callbacks mount handle params at the top that's always the most interesting like because a mount and handle params are the uh first uh, two functions that get called when the live view is instantiated, when it's started. So first mount once, then mount again, and then handle params. So this is cool to have at the top. Then I know how the live view starts. And then also the render. Yeah, you put it at the bottom. Usually we put it at the top. It's, it's you know, because like the bottom is for the most uninteresting functions. You know, all the pri private functions... Uh, we would put at the bottom, you know, that's why. And uh, yeah, whatever this is here, um, I'm just going to ignore that. Yeah, otherwise it's cool. I really like your your use of the child process, very smart. And I like that then you broadcast it to the general channel so that also every other live view that I'm starting um, subscribes to the same, same channel. I just don't know. Ah, yeah, the chat here. Uh, that is our name, right? So like the here, analyze moral regard. Yeah, just for naming sakes, because it's not like a chat. Uh, in If I read chat, I would assume it's a struct and not a name. You know, then you can just call it chat name, for example. And then it's clear that it's not a chat struct. It's just one string, for example. Yeah. All right, folks, uh, it is 7.01 where I'm living. Uh, we still have nine viewers, hey? We really made it to this time. Last time we had four or five, so thank you very much for joining. Um, thank you, this was fun for me too, yeah. Like even in my very broken state, I still enjoy that. I, I loved, I mean, I love this project. Honestly, it's an amazing, you know, little um, use case, but it really nicely shows how with Elixir, and live view, you can easily create these UIs, you know, just like have a couple of uh, lines of code uh, and then have so many things on top of it, like subscribe, broadcast right off the box. You know, we can scale this to millions of users if you want to. You know, we might need to change a little things here and there, but in general, it should work. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. And then also your use of the child process. That is something you don't really see that often because, you know, a lot of the... Um, uh, the the child like supervisors uh, like how you spin up like, basically if you use live view you don't really need to worry about creating your own child somewhere so this is really cool to see um, that yeah you even have its own task supervisor and uh, that you use that for waiting for the response amazing work 
really really cool i really like it and yeah the other uh, i mean you know you heard me with the other github repository about the assertions it, it just blew my mind all that macro programming it's just it, that's next level stuff so i will look into that more um and yeah, maybe you should too. There's a book out there called uh, Meta Programming in Elixir that um, shows you a lot about the dev macros, how to use macros and so on. So after reading that, you might understand the, the last GitHub repository better. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, thank you all for joining. It has been a pleasure. Um, I won't be here next Friday, I think. Yeah, it's the second. A friend of mine is having a PhD defense. But I might stream like on Wednesday or Thursday next week, you know, but I will I will notify you on uh, on Twitter and uh, maybe here on Twitch, too, if that's possible. So thank you all very much. Have a great weekend and I'll see you next week again. Cheers.